Hey everyone, this is Aaron Forster with Beers and Buddies. Uh, come to you from Phoenix, Arizona. So we are actually here for our Wednesday Hump Day uh, conversation. So right now I'm just waiting for uh, Scott, who goes by Crafty Historian for his uh, personal account. So as soon as he uh, chimes in uh, to this live broadcast, we're going to go ahead and add him to the conversation. So, oh, let's see. So East Coast Brew Babes, thanks for joining. Uh, so right now I'm just waiting for uh, Scott to chime in. But uh, essentially, um, today's topic is going to be on off flavors and beers, and also how to properly drink a beer, and also um, glassware, uh, how that actually really affects not only uh, beers, but also um, how it affects your, like, scotch or whiskey. Oh, and there's Scott right, right now, speak of the devil. Yeah, right now. Oh, waiting for the uh, waiting for the system to oh there it goes. Okay, so Scott uh, is here for us now. So just kind of a recap. Uh, so now that Scott's here, so today our topic is off flavors in beer. <clears throat> um, also um, about how to properly drink a beer in the sense of what to look for when you're trying to spot those off flavors, and also glassware and how it relates to beer, whiskeys, uh, scotches, things like that. Um, but also, as always, we're going to crack open a beer to get started and talk about what we're drinking today. All right. Um, so I'm interested to know what you chose because the last time we spoke, uh, you hadn't yet decided. So, yeah. Um, so today was a rather busy day trying to get things, uh, planned. Uh, work was, I'm working from home, both of us, Scott and I do. And today for me, I'm, I'm sure he's got kids, so I'm sure he's busy all the time. But for me, it was just, I had 10 zillion clients I didn't deal with today on the phone, so. But, oh, so today, uh, to answer your question, Scott, I am drinking Independent Pink Ladies from BRI. Is that a, a collab with Pink Boots? So, good question. The answer is yes. So, Yay. So, um, this is an IPL. So, Independent Pink Ladies, so IPL. Uh-huh. Uh, so Independent Pink Ladies is an uh, is a India Pale Lager, which is one of Scott's new favorite styles that's really coming about. Uh, it's only 50 IBUs, um, 6.1, so it's it's pretty it's pretty decent. But this one is made with the proprietary blend of the Pink Boots Society's hops. Uh, so there's like a specific blend that they actually came up with, but that's what I'm drinking today. So what about you? I think you found something so, too. Uh, uh, tri yeah, I, I did. Yeah, so I decided not to go American Craft. I don't. Uh, I don't venture too far from American Craft too often, just because um, I'm the only one in my house that likes these, and I like them a lot. Uh, but I couldn't resist. Found a Trappist Trapel. Uh, this is sitting at eight percent, so it's not too much higher than yours. Um, it's actually, it's, it's lower than I thought it was going to be. Yeah, uh, Trapels tend to be a little bit heavier hitting. Uh, beers uh but this particular one not so much which is why i thought i could drink 9.4 fluid one pint nine point yeah so basically two pints of it um so yeah belgian trappist ale so mine's gonna take a little bit longer to get off yeah though. so while uh, scott's pouring that so i'm actually so i'm gonna let scott talk a little bit um off so i need to go rinse my glass so this is part of today's conversation like for off beers how to serve beers properly and also have drink them proper. Oh, yep. So um, for starters, this is an IPA glass. Uh, so it's very, very different than say a different glass. So it's a little bit more stubby in the bottom, bells, and then tapers up, like almost like a, uh, oh, very much like a Glencairn would be for, yeah, for, for scotch or whiskey, but on a much larger scale. So I'm gonna go rinse out my glass prior to pouring. All right. Uh, East Coast Brew Babes, hi, welcome. I don't know if Aaron got you in already. Um, he may have done that before I got in, um, but thanks for joining us. Um, uh, so he's going to be drinking out of his IPA glass, IPL glass, makes sense. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with IPLs, it's not a super popular style, but it's basically an IPA that's been lagered by the name IPL. Tend to be a little bit lighter, crisper. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm going to be, this isn't actually the most correct glass to use when drinking a Trappist Belgian style ale, but it's the closest thing I have. Um, I'm surprised you don't have a Belgian glass. I know. Well, I don't drink too many of them. So, 
Um, but basically, you any any type of beer that you want to be able to uh, open up those aromatics. Um, boy, that's pretty. Um, yeah. There you go. <laughs> Crap. There it goes. Oh, was, hopefully it wasn't going to explode like my uh, beer that I did last time. <laughs> yeah, I was really worried about that because there's a lot of stuff that came out. <laughs> but yeah, so now that's kind of settled, we can actually see the clarity for doing a. Um, so hi. On oh, this, yeah, that uh, is really this IPL. Mm. Beautiful. But as you were saying about uh, aromatics, like the shape of the glass uh, definitely is going to be important. And we'll talk about that too, um, like why the bell shape is important or how like this one, is, it's belled and longer, more, more of a uh, shotgun, <laughs> shotgun barrel <laughs> approach. So one so, of the things I will say that I think Aaron and I have discovered as we drink beers together, he has, I, I've been drinking craft beer a lot longer than him and by a lot, like three years, four years. I don't know exactly how long. Yeah, what about that. But I think Aaron's palate is better at picking up off flavors. Uh, and so um, when we get to off flavors, I mean, I can throw my couple cents in there and I will, but um, I, I think one of the things we have found is, is Aaron picks up on subtle flavors that I don't. Um, and so I think he has a natural bent towards that. I don't know if that's genetic or what, but. Well, some of it's genetic. I mean, your, your tongue, everyone's also, you're raised with different foods. So uh, try, before we jump into off uh, flavors, keep in mind, uh, it's like a person who's raised uh, from a younger age with spicier food. Uh, like they're raised right from early on, spicy, spicy, spicy. So that way when they're an adult, like Tabasco or something like that is like ketchup to them and it's not spicy at all. Uh, and because of that, the, the capsaicin and the spicy of the peppers is going to affect your palate throughout your entire adult life and also your adolescence. Likewise, if you eat a lot of sugary sweets, if you eat um, a lot more bitter stuff. So depending on your diet on top of genetics will affect how you taste beer. So therefore the, the same beer will not taste the same to anybody. Uh, this exactly same, but that doesn't mean that or a certain style or certain notes that you're trying to go for certain flavor profiles that are just chemically speaking should not be there or should be there. Right. <clears throat> definitely. Uh, and there's definitely folks who can pick those notes up. Uh, and you might be one of those people who, you know, um, you, you pick a mob up, you know, for example, yesterday I opened up an IPA, which IPAs are a little easier, especially if they're older because the hot presence dissipates. Yep. But it was a total copper bomb. Um, you know, you, you Ooh, got that's... a little bit of a malty sweetness on the front, which immediately told me the IPA had gone too old. And then it just finished off with copper. It's like drinking pennies. And it's not the brewery's fault. I just had held it far too long. If you saw what I did at the start of this quarantine, I bought more beer than humanity ever could possibly drink by themselves. <laughs> and unfortunately, I bought so many IPAs, they just sat there, so. Yeah, and see, I, I have a home brew right now um, that's about a month old, and it's starting to... Starting to go uh, down? Yeah, the it's don't be wrong. It's still, there's nothing wrong with it. It still tastes good. It's just the nuances aren't quite as much there. Um, the hop right. profile is starting to change. So it's that's uh, part of the, the process, like I said, of uh, the chemical side. So we're going to jump right, like I said, into off flavors. Oh, actually, you didn't talk about... What, I mean, talk about these beers. What we're, oh, yeah. taste, what we're tasting. Yes. <laughs> So for this one, um, it's not overly bitter. Um, at 50 IBUs, it's really, really approachable. It's very sessionable. Um, if you the aromatics on it, and this is where the the glass comes into play with this one. It's a little sweet, um, a little floral, uh, not much on the fruit. Um, on the flavor, so this one, it's um. Mouthfeel is, like I said, it is more of a crisp, like a lagery. If you've had like any Pilsners or lagered beers, you're, you, it's easy to describe, hey, that, that crisp or uh, clean feel to it as you drink it, uh, which as far as flavor, the bitterness hits you right about the middle of the palate on this one, uh, not too far back in the tongue, and it's on the more, it's on the more floral side. Uh, with a little bit of resin uh, flavors to it as well. So not overly complex. It's very simple, but, but which is fine. It's an easy drinking beer because of it. Sounds yummy. <clears throat> oh, it's good. 
Sounds like I would drink a lot of that. Yeah, especially since it's already going to be like 91 degrees today. Uh, this is actually for a hop forward beer. This is very, very, very good. And that's saying a lot because Aaron isn't as much into hop forward beers. I, I don't, I'm of the opinion that you probably can't put enough hops in something um, until it starts to burn on the way down. Oh, um, <laughs> but, right? Um, I remember drinking a quad, a quad IPA once. I don't remember where I was. And I was like, okay, that's it. That's my threshold. That's too much. Um, yeah, a Dogfish uh, 120 is a, is a uh, quad IPA. Is it? Oh, geez. Oh, that's, yeah. and I haven't had that. I haven't had that. I'm afraid I've had to it. have it, I guess. Yeah, I so know. Dogfish, for those who, know, who are familiar with Dogfish, they actually do different. Care to be great. Yep, thanks for joining. Thanks for joining there's us. A, there's a few different levels of, you have a single, a double, triple, and a quad. Those are the most common. Dogfish does like a 60-minute. A ninety minute a and a a one twenty. Uh, they might even do like a, a one in between there. I don't, but I'm pretty sure those are the I big think three. I think those are the only three. Yeah. And the uh, the quad is a yeah, it's a, a quad IPA that's fourteen percent. Yeah. And it is. I've had so I I can't drink that beer anymore. Because you can't remember the first. No, time no. So I made I made a horrible mistake. So. My wife and I had tickets uh, to go see Swan Lake, see the ballet, uh, with her, with her uh, sister and her husband. So, I, okay, so I just got off work. I wanted a beer, and not realizing how high the ABV was on it, I pounded down 12 ounces of that beer on a slightly empty stomach. And then I went to the ballet. <laughs> and I had two glasses of wine at the ballet. By the time the second act had started, I was pretty, <laughs> feeling pretty good. So I'm sitting there, do, they're doing spins and jumps and all this kind of stuff for a small so lake. And I'm, I'm like, I'm spinning. And, <laughs> and so I'm like, okay. So I'm hanging on to my, to the, to my seat armrest. And I'm like, okay, okay. And so after the ballet is over, we get in the, our Uber to drive home because we'd all been drinking. We want to be responsible. So we, uh, I'm just sitting in the car, hanging on the, the door, like the o, OG oh, handle or the OS handle. Just, it's the only thing that's stable right now. Everything else is moving. <laughs> and so when I get home, um, I'm like, I don't feel so good. I'm like, I was uh, a dogfish 120 plus two glasses of cheap opera wine or opera ballet wine. And I just get in there like, oh, porcelain Jesus. I mean, praying to the porcelain God. <laughs> I never I never threw up, but I ended up like, okay, I'm just going to lay on the cold cold tile. Cold tile feels good. I don't feel so good. I ended up actually falling asleep. My wife knocks on the door. <laughs> I was like, honey, you okay? I'm like, what? Oh, okay. So anyways, every time I think of, hot, of uh, Dogfish 120, I have a hard time drinking uh, just the the flavor comes back because it was borderline throwing up but not quite so it's like uh. i think that i think that's probably the the most off loop we've ever taken on a conversation <laughs> but it's relevant um because Sick, this, like this talks about like this really big beers and stuff okay yeah so, anyway, so let's get right back into the, the topic so for those uh checking in now we are going to be talking about off flavored beers i'm sorry off flavored beer <laughs> Off flavors in beer, <laughs> not necessarily. We'll, there'll be some stories we'll share. We'll we won't name names of breweries, but we will talk about some experiences we've had with some off flavors at breweries. Yeah, and the Scott knows probably the biggest one I'm going to talk about. But oh, I know them all. They're great. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Um, and so what I'm drinking here, the Trappist uh, Trappel. Um, you get a very traditional Belgian yeast notes off there, clove, banana, definitely on the nose. But I also pick up some like apricot and peach kind of flavors yep. on on the on the mouth, and um, a oh, little tomorrow. bit of like. Thanks for joining again, um, Tamara. Thank you. Uh, the the chef. Yes. 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 Okay. Yep. Um, the there's also some like candy sweetness that's on this as well. Um, the color, of course, is. Um, a bit opaque, which makes sense. That's how you want it. Uh, if this was as clear as Aaron's beer, I would probably be a little concerned. Um, it's lovely. I love it. I will drink all of it. <laughs> all right. So just a recap. So Scott is drinking a uh, Trappist Trappel. So basically a Belgian uh, monk, Abbey style uh, Belgian beer. Uh, I'm drinking a India Pale Lager. 
uh, basically a lagered um, IPA, uh, which is at 6.1, and it is definitely clean and crystal. So, mm. And look, I'm just at the nice lacing. So I'll talk about glassware, hopefully by the end of this, you see why my lacing. So as far as off flavors, uh, like I said, these are ones that are the most common uh, flavors. And basically, I have a list next to me just in case, so I don't uh, get off topic too much. But the first one, too. the first one is, and I'm probably gonna mispronounce this. So all you chemistry folks, uh, correct us. So the first one is the off flavor is green apple. Now this one's called acetyl dihyde or acetyl dihyde. Uh, I think so, it's acetyl diacetyde. Yeah, so I, I'm probably mispronouncing this one, but anyways, this um, during the fermentation process, uh, it converts the yeast into starches and alcohol and ethanol and things like that. So it's little traces of apple are going to happen on just about any beer. Like, like we're they're they're so small, the human palate should not um, have this on this. Um, this actually, but when you really taste a green apple, the this happens from too much yeast. Uh, it's over pitch yeast, and uh, it's going to be this really strong or more pronounced flavor. Um, also, this is when it's too much yeast and a higher temperature. Uh, when it's starting to ferment as well. So it's not going to convert everything over properly. Now, it's in uh, certain beers, uh, apple is actually okay. Um, which which I, This was kind of new to me. I didn't realize, like, beer to guard. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> this is a type of beer. It is okay to have a more strong apple presence on it because that is its intention, um, much like how a banana flavor is actually – acceptable on more of a Belgian or a Hefeweizen yeast. Yeah, you typically don't want too much fruity notes or esters, what they refer to as on most beers. Um, I mean, wheat beers, uh, a lot of German style or some German style ales and most Belgian ales, you're going to get estery notes. But if you ever find like banana on a stout, unless it's intentionally put there as a adjunct, um, throw that thing away. That's, that's, that's not good. Um, yep. So, Acetylaldehyde uh, is the first one, uh, yep. and uh, I don't actually pick this note up. I don't think I've ever drank a beer where I have tasted um, green apple on my beer, um, and I think it's one of those flavors where I you it's sort of subtle. have to be. Uh, I think you have to sort of train your tongue um, to taste them, and that's why they have certain off flavor classes. Which I know yep. Aaron went through this. I've wanted to do it, but they basically take a flight of beers. And and so you, it's the same beer. And it's, yeah, it's the same uh, beer. It's the same beer, um, and it's usually Sam Adams Light, actually. That is the beer of choice by the Cicerone um, t taste panel, What I think the certification process. They use Sam Adams Light because it is a balanced beer. So, you know, it's, it's not the best beer, it's not the worst beer, but it's a balanced flavor beer, and it's w made well. Yeah. So, so what they do is they actually have eyedroppers that you can put into the various glasses on this off. -flight. It's called a pyramid. Um, and it's all, and when you're getting tested for the Cicerone uh, certification, for those who don't know, Cicerone um, uh, certification is like a sommelier, uh, is for wine. It's basically, it's a beer expert for beer, uh, whereas a sommelier is going to be for, for wine. But they do what's called a pyramid. And when they, it's basically you have three different beers. <laughs> Um, they're all, well, obviously it's the same, but three of them there. And when you taste them, you have to compare is, does one of them have it? Does two of them have it? Do all of them have it? Do none of them have it? So it's, it's a total blind test for it. Uh-oh, Scott found something important. Patrick Rue from the yep. brewery yep. just became a master Cicerone. That is, there's only a, like, what, a handful of those yeah, but in the world? Yeah, I was looking up to see how many of them there were. I know, like, sommeliers, there's like 150 or something. Yeah, well, there's um, different tiers of sommeliers and Cicerones as well. Yeah, Master Cicerone, are, there's a lot fewer of them. Um, yeah. And that's not necessarily because the test is exponentially harder than the, than the sommelier test. In fact, I would argue it's probably not as difficult uh, from what I've seen. But um, when, when you think you know something about beer, Master Cicerone's got you beat by quite a bit, but I can't seem to find a number. I'm sure it's, it's out there, but essentially, yeah, I mean, 
Yeah, so essentially, like, uh, in this process of tasting off flavors, when you're tested for these off flavors for the Cicerone, I, I still want to do it at some point. Um, I think Scott and I have talked about it many times. Um, yep. But it is a double-blind process because you might get a, a pyramid that has none, uh, no infections at all in this test. You might have one that has one or all three have infection. So it really plays with your mind and your taste buds at the same time. So the only time I've, I've really ever tasted apple was during this um, – off flavor test at health and brewing in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. So um, 16 as of 2018 in the world, <laughs> in the world. So uh, in 2020, you would at least add two more. So there's at least 18 in the world. I imagine it's probably somewhere around 2021, but right. That's, and that's at that smell. level, you know, that, well, you could just smell a hop and know exactly what it, and you could taste it, you know, exactly down to the, the details of each individual hop, because that's what they actually do at that level. They, they're going to test you. Hey, Here's a hop. What is it? Right. <clears throat> you got to know stuff. Yeah, so it, it's a lot of sensory uh, t tasting. So anyways, jumping to the next um, off flavor is butric acid. So this flavor that you're going to experience is baby vomit. Yeah, you don't want that. <laughs> that's, that's really, really bad. All right, so baby vomit. If you have any type of vomit type of like off flavors and stuff like that, this is going to be to bacteria. This is infection of beer, like true infection, like gross. Like if you have like an infected wound or something like that, that's happening in your beer. Uh, yeah, but, if, you, if, you got, if you have an open wound that smells like butyric acid, you're dead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I mean, this, this comes about mostly from um, very pr improperly um, – fermented uh, sour ales, actually, for when people are trying to sour beers. Um, if the contamination is not controlled in you know, conjunction with poor sanitation. So you're trying to sour something, you're adding bacteria to sour the beer, and it's in sanitary conditions, you just get infected beer that, that's basically going to be like a, a baby vomit kind of a... Uh, I have yet to experience this, thankfully. Yeah, I don't no. want it. Actually, I would think, and I don't know which order you're going in, because I don't know what what you're looking at, but I, I think one of the, the off flavors that I think most right encapsulates our, our craft beer drinking was um, uh, diacetyl. And this is an off flavor that you get in, almost, you, you, it's not an uncommon off flavor. It shouldn't be there, but diacetyl. Oh, um, butter popcorn. And, yeah. So that is yeah, actually and, the next one on my list. Yeah. So diacetyl is an interesting one for a couple of reasons. One, because it's easily, Avoided. You just need to allow your beer to rest at the end of its uh, crashing. You need to give your beer a couple, two or three days for the yeast that has already converted the sugars into alcohol. When it does that, it releases uh, notes that, if not re removed from the beer, will taste like buttered popcorn. So you let your beer right. rest for two or three days, and that yeast will reabsorb those flavors, and then it, it's not there. So oftentimes right. it's from beer that's been um, rushed. You'll also get under attenuated beer, um, which means you'll get a sweetness to it. But I like this one not because I like it on my beer, but because one of the very first beers that Aaron ever had before he got into drinking beer uh, was a beer that he said, I had a buttered popcorn beer. And I was like, well, that's that's weird. Yeah, um, so, well, let me preface this. So I went to a brewery in, here in Arizona, but I will not say whom. Uh, okay. I will not say I, whom. Okay. Um, so I went to a local brewery in Arizona, and this was when I was first started doing flights. And this brewery uh, said, hey, we have an experimental beer that we, we, we put together. And this beer uh, is called Yellow Number no. 6. I will let you do your own research to find that. It's Yellow Number no. 6. I will never forget this beer. And Yellow Number no. 6 um, <laughs> was, to me, from the bartender. Now, granted, this might be different. They might have deleted it, but it was told at that time that this is a buttered popcorn beer. Oh, Scott's looking on untapped. Is it not even there? I, I can't even find it. Yeah, uh, I, I would not be surprised if it's not there. They probably deleted it. Um, but anyways, it was told to me that, yeah, this is a buttered popcorn beer. It's like, hey, you can have your buttered popcorn. Like you go, it's a perfect beer mo or movie beer. Because you can have your popcorn and your beer at the same time. And so for me, I'm like, Ew. <laughs> I knew at this point in my head, I'm like, okay, I, I knew about diacetyl. I really did. 
But at the same time, I'm like, okay, did you screw up so bad that you got to lie? Or did you actually make, did you actually like have the balls to make a buttered popcorn beer on purpose? And Is I it yellow number six? Yeah. Or number something like that. But it, <gasps> No. No, that wouldn't be right. So anyway, Scott's trying to find it. So actually, so diacetyl, actually, it is going to be in every beer. Okay. So just let you guys know, mm -hmm. it will be present in every single beer. Um, you cannot get away from it. It's going to be there. But no. the, the parts per million is going to be smaller for the better quality beers. So it, it's going to be to the point where your palate will never find it. Like chemically, right. like, like molecules are so fine, so small, so few, you won't taste it. Um, it's when it's made wrong. And also, this is something that you can see also in um, winemaking, too. I'm not sure if you guys knew that um, with, with the diacetyl. Um, but you want on certain wines. Some beer, or I'm sorry, some wines, you do want that buttery aspect. Um, but in beer, you, it is, in, according to the Beer Association, you never want butter flavored anything on any beer. It is not supposed to be there. Um, I don't care if it's a, oh, hey, it's a buttered popcorn beer from a brewery who's trying to sell something maybe that they didn't want to throw away. Um, like probably what happened in my situation, but, um, as Scott was saying, yeah, you can do, there's various things in home brewing as well as professional brewing that you can do to, um, prevent diacetyl. This is probably the most common, um, problem that you pro experience in the craft beer. Oh, Scott's reading more. So yeah. You... Yeah. I was reading. Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> obviously I think a lot of these off flavors, um, you know, you can pick them up in your in your um, uh, in your drinking and in your tasting. But I've talked to a lot of brewers, and and they they start rattling things off. And most of these guys are chemists, um, and so they know all this stuff. And they're, they're just be like a biologist, basically. Yeah. Yeah, and and so so part of us is reading like, okay, I know what these off flavors are, but I don't know necessarily the chemical compounds that necessarily result in some of these. Some I do, um, you know, with with respect to metallic and oxidation and you know, diacetyl, what have you, but, you know, I'm reading one called estorvalic acid, which is cheesy, which, oh. Oh. yeah, I've never, I've never, <laughs> I've never, I've never even heard of this before on a beer. Um, which one is that Will Mellow with Age, huh? What, what, is that, what is that called again? It's called, it's, it's so valoric acid, it's so valoric acid. Oh, that's not, my, uh, that's not on my list, that must be a very uncommon one then. Yeah, it says a sometimes component of some highly hopped beer styles, but in general is considered an off flavor caused by oxidation of the alpha acids in hops. Okay, and so may be confused oxygen. with, okay. uh, huh? Yeah. So to avoid it, use fresh hops. So if you're throwing old hops in, the alpha acids in there are going to potentially give you uh, cheesy beer. Cheesy? That's disgusting. Cheesy. That is disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> I just have this mental image of this like Fear Factor episode <laughs> and they're eating like a, a giant pile of uh, a, like American cheese and, uh, and like in and your beer. Mag <laughs> yeah, maggots. Yeah. Oh gosh. No. 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 Thank you. Yeah. See, I've never heard of that one. That one's uh, new to DM me. DMS. I've heard of that one. That's that actually one the next good. one I was going to jump to. Uh, this one also could be related to as cabbage or mm -hmm. canned canned corn. Uh, so obviously, fresh corn does not taste the same as a canned corn. Um, oh, cream corn. Yeah, it's cream gross. corn. Yeah. So this one is um, most common is actually not boiling hot enough during your boil or long enough because it, it's part of it uh, it's part of the, the germination of the barley um, mm -hmm. and if you don't boil hot enough or long enough uh, this these characteristics uh, can also impart um, this also it's, you know might not get it initially but as you go to crash your beer um, after it's fermented and you go to crash the temperatures down, it actually becomes more prom prominent um, as you uh, as the wort uh, ch chills down. Um, this is part of the reason why you chill fast as well. Um, this is yeah. something that come, come about. So if you just let it just kind of hover around 140 and let it just naturally get there, you don't want that. This is where you, you crash the beer temperature as fast as you can down to fermentation temperature to try to reduce the DMS. This would also help to reduce a potential oxidation. Yes, um, that's which it. Obviously, you want some of that early on, earlier in the thing, but when you're transferring your beer or if you're cooling the beer and it takes too long. I mean, I remember 
I, I, I remember, I don't know if it was with you or who it was with, but I remember trying to cool a beer and it took me like four hours to cool the beer. Oh, that was uh, our first beer. That was our first yeah, homebrew. Yeah, we tried to get it from boil down to a place where we could drop it into uh, fermentation, and it's like, oh, my God, the amount of time this is going to take. It took us forever well, to, on our first one. I was worried about that. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and oxygenation or oxidation of your beer. Um, to me, I'm less concerned with this. Um, it just tastes like old beer. Uh, I think your beer just ends up tasting a little bit stale, like cardboard a little bit. Um, I'm okay drinking that more than I would be okay drinking diacetyl. Mm, well, that's the other thing too. It's like there, you have like some that are very similar, and that's the thing. Some of these off flavors kind of cross, or they're depending on your palate, you might taste them very similarly. Um, so, like cardboard is actually technically another one that's oxidiz heavy oxidiz excuse me, oxidization is heavy cardboard. Um, it is a off flavor. Um, and part, there's a few ways you can have that happen. Um, like for oxidization, you can have it where you, uh, goodness, like when you, if you don't, if you're homebrewing, this is actually a good uh, experience because I homebrew. When you go to transfer into a keg or if you go to transfer into a secondary fermentation, um, if you just let it, let gravity do its job and it's from a spigot to the bottom, you have this giant thing and it drops and and it's kind of almost like a bubbler with like for a fish tank it's going to oxidize your beer at the molecular level and your beer is screwed so when you go to transfer you actually fill up the as much co2 in the vessel as much as possible to act like a barrier mm -hmm. and then you have a hose that goes all the way to the bottom so that way it's filling up from the bottom all the way up and then it's it's slowly pushing the co2 acting almost like a cap so that way you don't get it oxidized where I ran into some home brewing experiences, whereas when, here's the thing, when you go to dry hop, I didn't, I actually made the mistake of transferring to a secondary vessel. The beer was fine. It was totally good. And then I dry hopped and it's what's called a spider. It's like this giant mesh looking little container. Beer so, Brewer 21, yep, thanks for beer, joining us. Yep. So I used my spider uh, with my hops and I dropped it in there. Those, those hops actually, because they're, there's a bunch of oxygen in those as well. By dropping them into there, it oxygenated the beer, and actually two beers screwed it up. Yeah. Um, because I didn't do it properly. Had I put them in during towards like the last few days of fermentation, wouldn't have had the oxygenization issue. Wouldn't have had like actually I got DMS on it too because of that as well. Yeah, I think <clears throat> I think collectively we ended up talking to like five or six different brewers about how to yeah. solve that problem. Yeah, um, it was one of those things where it just, I'm like, why, this is two IPAs that failed, and then ultimately I have my third IPA, which is on tap right now, which I'm probably going to get after this. Um, huge success. I do. Everyone who's tried it, even if they don't like IPAs, they say it is the most, like, if I'm going to drink an IPA, I'm going to drink this. But non-dry hop. Yeah, but but it, I use hop oil for instead of a okay, dry hop. Okay, so it did increase that, that hop note. Right. I use one milliliter of hop yeah, oil for five gallons and it did the same effect as actually as dry hopping this is what sierra nevada uses for their uh, hop hunter um or mm, and that's a good that's a good one um yep. that's it that's i'm trying to think a uh, lupulin powder is another way that you can do that that's another way of doing it yeah so um but jump, jumping back into the right topic uh is another off flavor is rotten egg <sighs> Yeah, yeah, so beer brewers not, right, want some want some of your beer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I want some. Oh, some of my beer. I, I, honestly, uh, hey, I will say this much: I am working towards ha opening up a brewery uh, down the road. And uh, the cool part about all the beers I'm making uh, at home brew is they are all uh, gluten reduced beers. The reason why I'm doing this not to be a trendy or or particular reason. I do this for my wife. Uh, she actually has celiac. She can't. Um, she actually she has a true um, a condition when it comes to to an allergy purposes. So she loves beer though. That's the problem. So uh, all the home brews I make um, are gluten reduced or gluten. So they're not really gluten free. I, but I use an yeah. enzyme from White Labs, and that breaks it down. So they are gluten reduced. So she at least can have one or two before she starts like okay I, I, that's it, yeah. and uh, <laughs> she can she can enjoy it. So down the road. So but um, but yeah IPA. Uh, so it tastes great, very tastes perfect.
perfect, no off flavors, and it was gluten reduced as well. You would never know. Almost like Stone's Delicious IPA, you would never know it is gluten re reduced beer. So, anyways, mm -hmm. but uh, let, so my wife, let's do it. Opening after pandemic 2020. So my wife. That's uh, what we'll call it. We'll call it post pandemic brewing post -pandemic company. Post pandemic brewing. Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyways, back to off flavors. Uh, yeah, for the rotten eggs. Uh, now this one is okay. So I'm, this one I'm not more as familiar with. I've yet to have this experience. I'm gonna have to read this one. Um, so hydrogen sulfide uh, hydrogen. is is normally produced by yeast during early lager fermentation, and is typically removed during fermentation when carbon dioxide bubbles help carry away the molecules of the beer. Okay, cool, makes sense. Um, Let's see, the program, blah, blah, blah. Appearance of hydrogen uh, sulfide on finished beer. There's only one beer style that actually is actually okay to have this, which is really weird. It's a, it's a, it's a British style ale that actually is, it's okay to have this compound. So it goes to figure it's, it's, it's there's an exception to every rule, I guess. Um, mm. But it's what this really talks about is poor yeast health like the yeast the they themselves are an organism um and so if you're getting rotten eggs you're getting basically sick yeast uh, you're getting sick little organisms trying to do their job and they're just not having it yeah and it could be from repitching too much you know you're not uh propagating fresh yeast yeah i mean it's just it's worn out yeast they're sick yeast it's just not good a good yeast health um, that's why, as Scott even said, like a lot of uh, brewers end up having a, uh, like more of a chemistry or a biology background because you're trying to. I mean, it's it's very expensive to buy a new yeast for every single beer that you make, so they try to collect the yeast and propagate that and reuse the yeast over and over because as long as they're getting fed, they're happy for the most part. Yeah, and as long as that yeast is good and still not giving you any funky flavors, like. This one. Um, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Trying to think of other. Uh, phenolic is another off flavor. Um, if you've ever drank a beer that tastes a little bit uh, plasticky or like band aids. Band aid. Yeah. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's, that's also having to do with um, uh, yeast strains as well. Um, you know, I mean, and, and this, this is a topic in and of itself. What's the most important ingredient in, in a beer? I mean, is yeast the most important ingredient? I mean, we're talking about these off flavors. If, if yeast can quantifiably alter the, the nature of a beer that was otherwise fine, uh, maybe yeast is the most important. Um, I, I mean, I know we've, water, had, we've had this I mean, discussion time and time. I've talked about water being the most important. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's, it's hard to say. Um, I don't know. Where, where do you land on that? I mean... I know it's a slightly off curve here, but if yeast can cause these off flavors to beers that otherwise would be fine to drink, maybe that's the most important or <clears throat> sorry, we don't have a nice. mute button for that. <laughs> sorry. I don't, not that quick. It just really came on out of nowhere. We're starting to get into uh, the drier season here in Arizona. So for me, my allergies are going to start kicking up. Um, that's a good question. I would say we've had brewers on our uh, live chats before. And a lot of them say water is probably the most important uh, because it is beer is predominantly water. Um, but at the same time, I would argue that, that that yeast and water are probably on the same um, <clears throat> level because your grain bill is going to change. You have a, you use all sorts of different grains. You can all all sorts of different hops to make the beer. But at the end of the day, clean water that's at the right pH level combined with healthy yeast, even if you don't care for the beers, um, like the yeast profile, or I'm sorry, the, uh, the grain bill profile, it still could be a clean, well-made product, although you don't like the flavor. I mean, yeah. that's, so that, that's where I think yeast and water really play into effect for it, which is kind of jumps into the next one is, it's kind of for clean is mercapitin. Now this one is rotten vegetables, or skunk. So skunky oh, beer. Skunky. Skunk. So Heineken. Pretty much what they bottle in a Heineken. Or Corona. Some, some people say corona. corona beers are skunky beers. Uh, some, oh, at least that's what some people says. Um, so here's a quote I'd love to read. Uh, so Cut Water Brewing um, said that <laughs> the uh, it's, this is the main chemical responsible for bad breath and flatulence. <laughs> Also, this is, <laughs> this is the same chemical that 
skunks actually secrete from their glands. So it literally is a skunky beer. So that's it is, bad. yeah, it's the same chemical that comes from the glands of skunks. So that's why you get it. So, oh. So uh, Beer couple. Brewer said water first, second yeast. Now, why why do you go, why, what, what's your argument there, Beer Brewer, um, for that? And a couple of bartenders join. Thank you so much for joining us. We just posed the question, which is more important uh, in beer? Is it uh, water, yeast, uh, your grain, or your hops? Uh, Aaron and I, I think we can come to consensus on that one and say there's an equal amount with, with water and yeast. Uh, but Beer Brewer says uh, water first. So I'm interested to know, one, why yep. he thinks that, and two, what a couple of bartenders think. Yep. So, But to jump back to the skunky one, this one actually really boils down to light. Uh, that is the main um, contributor to causing a rotten vegetable skunky beer is because of light. Uh, if you have too much light during fermentation or even, like, in the store, uh, this so, is why, that's why Corona... So I'd say like yellow and green bottles aren't your best bet or clear yep. bottles. Clear bottles are not a good choice for beer. This is why you have dark glass bottles. This is why you have cans and also stainless steel vessels and yeah, dark glass for your beer because clear bottles eventually will give you this skunky beer. Yep. I mean, it's simple. very true. I mean, think about any, and, and what's funky about it is that um, some of the most popular beer in the world, Corona, for example, comes in this light, this light, completely translucent uh, glass. It's pretty. And it just, it sits on, yeah, I mean, it's pretty, it looks nice at the beach, but it sits on your shelf, and God knows how long it's been sitting on the shelf with all these different lights hitting on it. It's going to make your beer taste bad. Yep. Um, so, funny story. So, um, my mother actually was born and raised in Arizona and stuff like that. So we lived mostly like between San Diego and Arizona, like the Phoenix Valley. I had half, pretty much half my life in either state, California and Arizona. We moved to Georgia for nine months, though. That's a long story. I won't get into it. But we lived in Georgia, like just outside Atlanta, for about nine months. And when we got there, oh, oh we got a comment about the, our, our question. I'll, I'll come back to my. I'll come around about. <laughs> This is water makeup per style can change the final product more than anything. Okay. Um, yeah. How well, so? pizza, pizza in the, in New York supposedly tastes better because the water is more minerally tastes better than say California, like the dough. So I could, but. Mm. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I would tend to agree with you on that. I mean, I, I'm not as much of a brewery here. I'm going to beer brewer 21. I'm assuming he's a brewer. Um, Either home brewer or maybe he's got a brewery. I don't know. Um, maybe I mean, it's a tough. Question. Here's here's where I would say maybe that that has some merit, and this is arguing against my own conclusions. But when you think about like bourbon or scotch, and they always talk about that limestone water in bourbon, for example, one of the why is bourbon out of Kentucky so good? It's because of the limestone water that they're using, right? So you, uh, and the truth your own question is, right there. Yeah, and the truth of the matter is, is that if you make a bad base whiskey, your barrel isn't going to isn't going to save you, right? Distillers will tell you that if you if you throw a bad clear whiskey into the barrel, the barrel isn't going to save it. And so we might say the same thing if you throw a bad <clears throat> sugar water into into the fermentation vat with good yeast. With good yeast, maybe I don't know. I don't. I don't. Now I now I feel like I don't know what I don't know. Good point, Beer Brewer 21. Thanks for adding. But uh, jumping back to what I was saying about living to Atlanta. So when we lived there, this is actually a very good parallel between like skunky off flavors um, and also milk. So when we went to Georgia, there is a brand. I don't recall this brand. And if anybody knows this brand, um, they actually – you go to the grocery store now, and the, it's just plastic milk jugs. Uh, unless it's like in a paper carton or like a paper milk container. It's usually – Clear, clear-ish. Like it's like slightly opaque, but it's clear. You can see the white milk. This brand in Georgia said, we don't do that. We actually, so they did a totally 100% opaque yellow jug of milk. You could not see the milk in it because their philosophy was the lights in the grocery store and light in general contaminates the milk. And honestly, 
we were like, oh, this is oh, it's a gimmick. Oh, no, 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 this is this is bull. You can taste the difference. Like we literally did a side by side taste test between two percent and two percent, and all and you can definitely taste the difference between a, a jug of milk or a glass of milk that was in a clear container versus an opaque one because there's bacteria that's going to be in milk anyways, just naturally. And there's so the light affecting it, just like with beer, affected with the milk as well. So I, I definitely see how, how like change, just the bottle color is very, very, very important to have. But you, you've been a taste beer. tester for quite some time. Apparently. Yeah, with milk. <laughs> I've never thought about doing milk before. <laughs> yeah, it, it, so try, try it at home. But this is where it gets a little different because you have glass containers, you have plastic containers, and then you also have cardboard, like wax line ones. And unfortunately, they're all going to impart different flavors. So if you can find like milk that's in a clear, clear plastic jug versus an opaque one, they're both plastic, try tasting them both side by side. You will notice, you should notice the difference unless they're both like basically the same day. Like, if you're like a, but it, that's the philosophy is on that one uh, dairy was light contaminates their beer flavor and they do. Mm. Yeah. So, Makes sense. If it contaminates beer, why wouldn't it contaminate other liquids? So uh, speaking of contamination, this next one actually is probably the most off flavor I get. A lot of people don't get this one is uh, metallic blood mm -hmm. or metal. Um, yeah. So like iron, this one is probably the most common one. And um, this one's partially for two reasons. One of two. One is really, really heavy um, iron, or basically minerally metallic in the water. Uh, so this goes back to our original conversation about water being very, very, very important. But the most common one that I find, dirty tap lines, dirty oh, taps yeah. and dirty beer lines. So one of the things that I think is interesting, and, and you, you'll know this from, from places you go, well, not recently, but if you go to a place that doesn't sell a lot of beer, um, especially if they have taps, is and I, and I frequent a place that's like this. I like the joint, but it doesn't sell a lot of beer off taps, and normally by the time I get there, they haven't sold much. I always ask them to run the beer <clears throat> off the tap because any beer that sits in a line for too long is going to get – it's going to get changed in its flavor, mm -hmm. but – Oftentimes, if you go to a and I'm not saying that this restaurant does that, but I suspect if you don't sell a lot of beer, you're probably not spending a lot of time and money having your lines cleaned. Or there is another thought. Let's say they, their primary seller is Coors, and they have this one random, hey, we have this IPA from so-and-so that nobody orders because it's a, it's a, gosh, it's a, oh gosh, a, like a Moe's Tavern kind of thing where they're only going to serve Duff. Yeah, it's, it's, it doesn't meet the flavor profile of a clientele. That's right. not why they're there. Oh, dive. I'm thinking of a dive. It's a dive yeah. bar, yeah. They want, their, they want their Bud Light. Maybe a Bud Platinum, but that's on a crazy day. Yeah, so they're drinking like Tecate, Bud Light, something very, very, just very domestic. And so these, <laughs> uh, so you, you'll find this like in that situation as well, not just uh, where they serve beer rarely, but in where the clientele is going to uh, favor a uh, pitcher as opposed to a pint. Yeah. And I think in so often we, we've we've encountered people or we've encountered beers at production facilities where I'm not even sure that the people who are serving the beer, which is a whole discussion in and of itself, how well trained should servers be in the product they're making. I remember going to a brewery once here locally to me and the guy said, I don't drink beer. And I'm like, well, then why are you working at a brewery? If you don't drink beer, then you don't know your product. Um, but how often do people not realize that they're drinking flawed, infected beer? Um, a lot. I think there's yeah. a lot. I think I mean, there there's, is. There's people who I know in the beer community, very prominent people who are awesome. They're great people. They love craft beer. They love the scene, the culture, everything around craft beer. And you'll ask them, hey, what do you like? And they'll start rattling off breweries and or beers. And I'm like, I sometimes I have to, I'm, in the back of my head, I'm like, Oh no, no. Yeah. Bad beer. Ugh, don't so with, drink that. Please don't drink that. But they do. And this is where it kind of like. Yeah. And so without naming names, because we're not, because, so here's the thing Aaron and I are not about trying to drive people down. So no. we don't want to speak negatively about people, but we have to be honest as well. But we don't have to be 
as transparent unless you want to know you can contact us and we'll be happy to privately tell you a message whatever but there is definitely a handful of breweries that we have been to some in his area of the woods some in mine although the ones i'm thinking of are closer to you um that i think have some off layers um and i remember consistently. having consistently yeah and i remember having an experience at one of these breweries where I went in and I sat down and I asked for, I, I didn't know what to have because the brewery had 11,000 beers on tap and I didn't know what to do. And so the bartender started giving me um, free samples, you know, how they'll do a little free taster. And after about three of them, I just, I just said, I, I, I can't buy any of your beer. This is that bad. And I walked away. Um, Wow. And, I never yeah. had gotten to that point. Yeah. Um, and I had another experience at another brewery out in, in Arizona area um, where I did order the flight. I paid for the flight, um, but I had a similar experience where I told the bartender, I said, none of these are good. None of them are to style. Uh, and he was surprised because he said, well, no one has ever said anything negative about the beer, which raises two questions. One, do people not know what they're drinking? Or two, are people not willing to be honest when they encounter a beer, because to me, I'm an, I'm a, I'm a teacher. So I have no problem giving you, um, authentic criticism. It's not intended to be rude or personal. It's just, here's a way to improve. Um, you know, um, I don't, I don't know. Where do you land on that? That's a tough one. Uh, but I think you're right. That, uh, people are drinking bad beer who don't know it for a part of, because they just, they just like beer and they like the way yeah. it makes them feel. And they're not, trained to understand uh, what certain flavors are. Like and that's why we have this conversation tonight is there are certain things to look for in these beers. Um, and if someone, like someone tried to sell you a buttered popcorn beer, they're full of crap, regardless of which way they go. Um, <laughs> which is kind of funny because like my in-laws. So when I first started drinking craft beer, it was actually not too long after uh, my wife and I uh, started dating. Um, and so what I'm to the point now when I go to my family get together is I bring something special, usually something I've been kind of hoarding for a while, just to let them all experience. Now, when they are the ones who are supplying the beer, they don't bring the Bud Lights as much as anymore. They try to like bring something at least a little bit better um, or even something local uh, instead of doing that big beer. And they've actually started, I, I want to say they've upped their, their palate, their game. So now they actually have an appreciation. They actually like, oh, I don't like that beer anymore because now I understand why. It's not because I'm being influenced or peer pressure. It's because I understand the the reason behind the contamination mm -hmm. or the off flavors or something like that. Yeah. Plus, you know, and then this is a this is a bit of well, I'll say tongue in cheek, but it, it's a mode of contention for me because I I don't like Bud Light or Coors Light or those beers. But the reality hey, is that here's, Scott, here's a free beer. Yeah, I'll drink it. I'll drink it. And I've paid for those beers. But two, you, I, I dare you to find me. Now, now, this is the tongue in cheek part. Granted, the big brewers are working with a lot of um, five minutes, by the way, automation. OK, um, I dare you to find me a craft brewer who can make consistently the amount of beer that Bud Light makes or Anheuser-Busch makes and make it taste like nothing. That's impressive. Yep. Well, and all, as to answer the other half of your question regarding people, you when you have the owner or somebody who's very prominent in the small family-owned or independently owned brewery right there in front of you, who's put, put their heart and their life and their money, their house, whatever on the line, you don't want to insult them to their face because no. you want them to, to achieve. You really do. You everybody yeah, wants absolutely. the best for that business to succeed, and they don't want to hurt their feelings but at the same time um by not giving honest criticism um is also it's just as hurtful if not worse yeah I speaking agree. of brewing we actually have crusader brewing thanks for joining us out of bakersfield california so that was very yeah, dramatic anyways, <laughs> but, you know, so yeah i think not being honest with the the brewery um uh, you don't have to be insulting either it's all oh, this tastes like crap okay. no absolutely not so and that's the thing. If you go on Untapped, uh, some, there's some really funny videos where brewers will actually read some of these negative reviews of their beers or say, oh, it tasted like poop or whatever, and they don't give a rationale. This is where 
the understanding of why you taste what you taste, what your taste buds are telling you is very important for a craft beer drinker, not just to drink it to enjoy it. That's the, the first step. The step beyond that is the understanding the, the behind the scenes aspect of it so that you can make, you can drink better beer. Mm. And so if you say, Hey, I don't like this beer. It's crap. I'm going to give it a one on untapped. Why? Is it because you don't like the flavor? Didn't like the style? Or is it because it's contaminated? So yep. is it, if it's contaminated, what is it contaminated with? This tastes like Band-Aids, or this tastes like rotten egg, or this skunky, or this is like apple or diacetyl butter popcorn beer again. So that's the thing uh, where it comes into is you need to be honest with whoever's serving your beer. You don't have to hurt their feelings to say, hey, uh, FYI, I'm tasting this. Do you taste it as well? Yeah. <clears throat> because, like I said, I was saying at the very beginning of this whole video is your taste buds are not the same as mine, but there are certain things that are should be consistent across the board yeah. that you should not taste. Yeah, and if you ever have a brewer ask you, be honest. I had a brewer, he just recently opened a brewery, and he said, what do you think of this IPA? And I said, man, to be honest, it has a little diacetyl. And he said, you're, not the, you're the second person to tell me that. Tried his beer the next time he made the exact same beer, flawless, boom. And I was just like, okay. He knew it. I knew it. There's no point sugarcoating around it. But if you're asked, just be honest, be kind. Um, yep. I mean, so and we've talked about all these different off flavors and talk, like, but we never actually got to the how to drink a beer properly, like, like what to look for or, or glassware. We're actually running out of time. Um, we only got a couple minutes left. So just to kind of very lightly touch on it, glassware does change the flavor of beer and whiskey. Yep, absolutely. Yes. Oh, absolutely. I would never, well, I don't want to say I would never, but, you know, when you're drinking whiskey, for example, there's certain glasses that are specifically designed to do certain things yeah, to whiskey, with, whether it's beer. to, mm. yeah, whether it's designed to enhance aromas or to, in fact, repress certain aromas in order to bring out other things. Um, the same thing is true with your beer. So glassware is vitally important. Don't just throw any beer into a 16-ounce pint glass. That's not going to yield you your greatest experience. Um, you know, if I were to throw this Trappist Ale into what Aaron's drinking, I'm going to lose some of the aromas on there because what I'm tasting, the esters on that are slightly different. So you want something that's going to bulb it out a little bit more. So. That's why I'll use a lot of Imperial Stouts, or should be supposed to like very big, deeper beers like Belgian beers, um, are typically very big, fat bell and, and more narrow at the top. Uh, IPA is a little bit more shotgunny. Good example is look, if you go to a, a decent tap house, oh, casual pint. Thanks so, for joining us. So, like, Sam Adams has their proprietary glass. The little lip. The little lip. And for them, their their shape is very similar to a, a traditional Pilsner-style um, glass that, like, Helton Brewing actually uses, one of the only people I know who does. But you know, Sam Adams has their very specific narrow, belled, and then slight lip. Uh, because I for almost them, brought that glass with me because I have one. Yeah, it's a very specific style glass because they feel so true to their style of that beer that they brew that you should not drink it in any other glass other than that shape. Yeah. I mean, I will totally agree with Scott. I mean, I've had Snifters versus Glencairns for whiskeys. Same whiskey, totally different experience. Yep, it is. And that's and that should tell you something, too. Like, if you drink a beer out of one vessel that you go, I don't care for this beer – Try it in a vessel that it's supposed to be served in if the first time you didn't. Same thing with whiskey yep. um, because it's going to alter the aroma and flavor profile. So, yep, Absolutely. I mean, and also like, as far as like drinking beer or whiskey, it's not just a taste thing. I mean, it, hopefully this is, you got to use all your senses. Uh, so there, my wife loves to bring this up is why do you, um, when you, why do you clink glasses when you, when you say cheers or uh, whiskey, have a, like a drink because it involves all the senses. And when you drink something like that, so you have sight, you have smell, you have taste and you have sound. So it's part of the whole experience. It incorporates all your senses. Um, oh, and, and touch, obviously touching your feeling the glass. Like, since it, you're, and feeling, feeling it in your mouth, feeling your mouth and stuff. So it includes all five senses um, when you drink a beer. So that's how you should drink. Uh, if you're intending to drink, I should say, and you want to drink to enjoy, that's going to be it. So, all right, guys. So we have about 30 seconds left, actually less than that. Uh, so thanks again for tuning in. 
And uh, Scott, any final parting words in our last 18 seconds? No. <laughs> drink more Drink more beer. <laughs> drink more beer. Uh, drink craft beer. Drink local. Uh, support your local breweries if you can. Uh, also, uh, local tap, tap houses and bottle shops if you can, like Casual Pint, who oh, just chimed in. So, bye, guys.